Hello everybody, I'm Liz Thompson and I'd like to offer you my heartfelt condolences and a very warm welcome as we unite in love and friendship to say farewell and celebrate the life of John David Drumsfield. Carol and Chris had seen a lot of John while he was in hospital and they'd said their goodbyes. He passed away held gently in their hearts on the 1st of March in Stepping Hill Hospital. We share a bond today, a bond that says we care about each other and will support each other as together you face one of life's most difficult moments. Our love and support go out to all of you who have been affected by John's passing, but especially to his wife Carol, his son Chris and his sister Sylvia, who sadly cannot be with us today. For thinking of her and anybody else who is watching remotely and quietly reflecting in their own way in their own space. You who are here are effectively holding space for those who can't be here in person. And I know John was a very popular man and I have every faith that he'll be remembered in many people's homes and future social gatherings. Today is about mourning for the times that were, the times that can no longer be, celebrating him for the very special person that he was, a hard-working husband, a proud and loving dad, a genuine, honest and humble man, and a very good friend to many. John has lived a good life, a long, successful life, 82 years, and a companion in life to many people. Chris has proudly helped to carry his dad on his final journey, which is equally an honour and a devastating thing for him to do. While you're remembering, please don't feel that you can't let your tears fall. They're the physical representation of your love for John and your grief at losing him. And while you might be shedding a tear or two of sadness, it's perfectly fine to smile at some of the memories you have of him. In one sense, I know that's really hard, but in another it's easy because he gave you so much to smile about. And you've all got lots of memories of time spent laughing and having fun. Don't only think of him in terms of what you've lost, but everything that you've gained the love, laughter, friendship and inspiration that he brought to your lives. Some people touch our lives with a truly remarkable depth and from everything I've been told, I can tell that John was one of those people. In many ways, all of you were part of his journey. We'll have here today a mosaic of happy thoughts and sad thoughts and wonderful memories that serve to paint a vibrant picture of the man that you all knew and loved. A piece of artwork is like a metaphor for life. You have an idea of what you want, to, want it to look like, you sketch it out, you lay the foundations of your ideas on paper or canvas, and then you begin your creation, only to discover that what's turning out isn't exactly what you envisioned. Painting takes on similar unexpected twists and turns as reality unfolds before you, moment to moment. How you choose to respond changes the outcome entirely. Exactly the same thing that happens in life. And looking back on the life that John shared with you all, I see two great themes that stand out. Themes that are common to many lives, yet John expressed them in his own unique and unforgettable way. The brush strokes with which he painted the picture of his life were bold and clear. The themes I have in mind are creativity and strength. John was a man who inspired people. Henri Matisse once said that an artist should never be a prisoner of himself, a prisoner of style, a prisoner of reputation or of success. John had a strong sense of self-belief and he always remained true to himself. When he was impassioned by something, he gave it his all. He achieved what he'd wanted in life to be able to dance to the beat of his own drum. Much of our humanity arises from the capacity that each of us has to love. And this is indeed a love story of the most profound kind that I'm speaking to you of here today. Because John's whole life is about love. Central to all of this, his love for Carol, Chris and his family and friends. And the cherished and irreplaceably rich life that he shared. And Chris has written a great tribute to his dad. Welcome. <coughs> A 
Hello everyone, and thank you for coming. Everyone here will have memories of my dad, John, and I'm no exception. All of them good memories. I remember when I was aged about five or six, being taught how to use various power tools at an age where most kids were playing with plastic hammers. I was using veal tools, band saws, power drills and angle grinders. And thanks to my dad's good training, I've still got all of my ten fingers. I learned so much from him about the safe and correct use of a huge range of equipment and had fun while learning woodworking skills and assisting in making some great things. Before I joined the Air Cadets, aged 13, we always used to go off on Sunday morning adventures, which could be anything from exploring an old abandoned hospital, searching for the remains of a crashed aircraft in the Peak District, rock climbing on the Great Orm in Land of No, or visiting museums. Many of these experiences have had a last lasting effect on my life, having worked as a climbing instructor and still having an interest in aviation archaeology. At the time, it was incredible that I was given the freedom to wander off by myself and practice my mountain navigation skills. I remember one day when my dad came home from work with a chemistry textbook from the late 1800s that he'd found in a bookshop. He knew I had an interest in chemistry at the time. A few days later, he came back from work with a few packets of chemicals that he'd acquired from somewhere. We spent an interesting afternoon following the instructions for making gunpowder, and I still have ten fingers. <laughs> I remember many evenings as a kid with my parents listening to my dad playing his guitar and singing, something which got me interested in playing guitar myself, although I never had his skills. Hearing some of the songs that he'd written, from a long time before I was born, when my parents were getting to know each other. This is one thing that gave me an insight into his sense of humour, for which he was well known. All my life I have been surrounded by his artwork and artist materials, and he was an inspiration for both myself and my mum Carol. She started glass engraving and became chairman of the Peaks and Plains branch of the Guild of Glass Engravers, and eventually ended up becoming a glass engraving teacher. Personally, I never shared his skills artistically, but learned many skills that I found useful in other ways. John was always incredibly supportive of myself and my mum's life goals, one of which was when they went to New Zealand. It had never been something that John had thought about doing, but when the opportunity arose, he was 100% behind the plan, and they spent two years living in New Zealand and working. My mum at the local hospital, and my dad doing his own art and getting involved in the local art scene. During his late middle ages, he developed heart issues, culminating in a triple heart bypass. The bravery and determination that he faced these problems with was incredible. Not only did he have to overcome the physical aspects of the surgery, but also a phobia of medical procedures. He wasn't happy about the prospects of surgery, but didn't really have a lot of choice. The surgery was expected to remain effective for about 20 years, but he managed to get 26 years out of the repairs. It's impossible to sum up a lifetime such as my dad had in so few words, but he certainly made the most of it, loved by all his family, and everyone here who will have special memories of him, which we will keep forever, and he will be very much missed by us all. Thank you. Following his older sister Sylvia, John was born in Oldham on the 2nd of May 1940 and that's probably the most ordinary thing about him. John was one of life's free spirits and due to family circumstances, changed schools a lot, he went to 13 different schools. He befriended Ted who fitted sprinkler systems on ships and he introduced him to his mum Lily and they got together. Ted wanted to go to South Africa to work for himself and assured by the powers that be that he would have a job when he got there, but it wasn't to be, so they went on safari for two years instead. <laughs> and John went to an Afrikaans school and learnt the language. He had a lot of freedom during that time, and loved learning about the animals, etc. You could call it the school of life. They even met Haile Selassie. He's done so much in his life. He was always determined, and if he had a goal in mind, he'd work really hard to achieve it. He joined the Scouts, and every Friday night for a year, he worked hard to get his, his Queen's Scouts Award. So dedicated that despite his natural squeamishness, as we've heard, he did his best to complete the first aid course. He persevered, 
and despite passing out, he passed the award. He was rightly very proud of that qualification. He showed a natural artistic talent from being a very young age. He didn't have a clue what he wanted to do when he left school. But his wise art teacher at school kept back some of his work and applied for him to go to art college and he got in. The first time he walked in it was an absolute revelation. He was at Huddersfield College of Art for four years. When he finished college he got a variety of jobs like teaching pottery to housewives. He went to Leeds University to do his teaching diploma and during that time he got involved in the jazz scene. He couldn't read music but could play the guitar wonderfully. All of this was leading to him becoming the engaging, talented man that you all knew and loved. In his work life he was a senior lecturer teaching design for prints at Manchester Poly. He was a natural born teacher, inspirational. He had so much to give with his teaching. And a student of his remembered him seeing him at the MSG in 92 and later went on to be taught by him. His beautiful artwork adorns the walls at home and they've also been shown in galleries. And someone came up to him in John Lewis and said to him, you teaching me as a student changed my life entirely. What an accolade. And people say it's an absolute privilege to have known John. He was a man who loved the company of women and felt at home with them. When he went to Keep In Touch Club, he always attended with the ladies. He was an amazing man and greatly admired by so many. There are many, many people whose lives have changed immeasurably because of him. The first time Carol saw him was at the MSG Folk Club, a place that was very important to him. And he ran the singers club night on Monday for years. He was wearing a mustard roll neck jumper and he'd noticed Carol too. He'd seen her coming in on a few occasions, she'd park her guitar under the chair and she'd just sit and listen. He was a lovely singer and entertainer. John was intrigued by her and when they got talking he was genuinely interested in her. She loved how self-assured he was with an incredibly good sense of humour. He'd suddenly come out with this smile and it was beautiful. Something was happening here, and it wasn't long before they were on their first date, which was on John's 30th birthday, and Carol was 19. His best birthday present ever, and probably the gift that never stopped giving. John's best man was his friend Chris. They married on a glorious summer day at Timperley Parish Church on the 11th of August 1972. The service was beautiful, and they went to Bowdoin Hydro for the reception, it was fabulous. One of their neighbours said it was the wedding of the year. Afterwards they drove to Abbasop for their honeymoon and they had the best time driving around Wales in a little pale green Morsley 1500 with balloons attached to it. Their joy was complete when Chris came along and they named him after their best man. He was Carol's everything, her heart, her home, her best friend and soulmate. They had a brilliant relationship. He was easygoing, very caring, loyal, family orientated, hard working and so very supportive. As we've heard he encouraged Carol in her nurse training which led to them going to New Zealand. There was never a question that they wouldn't go. He didn't bat an eyelid when she should have suggested it. On the contrary, he had a great sense of adventure and the thought of a couple of years in New Zealand was very appealing. Part of his happiness grew out of him seeing Carol and Chris happy and flourishing. He was patient and kind, a calming influence. Carol never saw him panic, apart from when the pressure cooker exploded. He was a vision to behold, crouched down as if to avoid flying shrapnel. It's amazing where life can take you. And Carol and Chris have followed Chris in his interest too. They've had a very full and rich life together with a lot of fun along the way and sharing some very special moments. And now Roger Pritchard, has, who's known John for he, forever and has since become the proud owner of Humphrey, which amongst other things he's going to tell you about, after which he'll share a poem on Carol's behalf. Welcome, Richard. Hello. 
Uh, Carol kindly asked me to say a few words about Joan, and you've heard more or less everything. Not everything. Well, not everything. But I, I, I first met Joan, uh, gosh, all right, I'll start again. When John was born, the eye ring, the mould was broken because there's ne never been another John. He's a unique person, talented musician and an artist with a quiet, very dry sense of humour. And I, f I first met John, and it's been made, mentioned previously, at the MSG Club in Manchester. Um, and it was where we were doing the folk singing. And um, I was there one night with a friend of mine, he's here now, Dave, um, and John performed. And he, he went by the name of Droney, partly because of his name, Johnsfield, but partly because of his attitude and the way he, he, he was a, such a funny sense of humour. It was so dry, it almost droned but it was so humorous. Anyway, he, he did become the compere at the club, uh, and it was a short time after that uh, that John and myself and a couple of friends we decided to form a quartet, uh, and John managed to acquire a huge double bass, which you've heard about, and it was called Humphrey. Humphrey's now in the bedroom, stuck in the corner. Um, I, I usually say good night to Humphrey. Uh, and the thing is, there was a problem because it's such a huge thing. It, it, what did you, how did you transfer it from one place to another? Well, no, it didn't bother John. No, no. I'll, I'll take the spare wheel, a, a spare passenger seat out of the car. Carol, Carol will sit in the back. <laughs> They've been together ever since. Anyway. <laughs> but I've got the old bass. <laughs> anyway, um, that, was, that was John. A problem? Not a problem. I'll solve it. And he did. Um, I've forgotten my notes here. <laughs> oh, it brings another episode to mind. Um, prior to working at Manchester, he did work for a while as a primary teacher and uh, his one ambition, he wanted to encourage the pupils to be creative and observant themselves. So he would love to take them outdoors to open spaces and the idea was to stimulate them, to express themselves artistically, to see the scope and possibilities within their reach. Unfortunately, there were a few available open spaces near the school, but he wouldn't have eaten. He found the perfect spot, the church graveyard. So, lovely open spaces, it stimulates them, it gets them really interested, you know, in thinking. And that, that was John. Uh, but eventually, everybody was able to tune into John's lateral thinking. Uh, he was a one-off, he'll be missed by all who were privileged to have known him. No more than Carol and their son Christopher. So, goodbye my friend John. Um, Carol's also asked me if, if I'd read out this, this poem, uh, which was written by R Rona Bramwell. <clears throat> the Lord saw you getting tired, and the cure was not to be found. So he put his arms around you and whispered, Come with me. With tearful eyes, we watched you suffer and saw you fade away. Although we love you dearly, we couldn't make you stay. A golden heart stopped beating, a beautiful smile at rest. God broke our hearts to prove it only takes the best. It's lonely here without you. 
we miss you so each day. Our lives aren't the same since you went away. The days are sad and they're lonely and everything goes wrong. We seem to hear you whisper, cheer up and carry on. Each time we see you picture, you seem to smile and say, don't cry, I'm in God's keeping. We'll meet again someday. Thank you. It's lovely to hear all those stories about him. And now we're going to pause for a moment in quiet personal reflection to give each of you the opportunity to say goodbye in your own way. Those of you who have faith may also like to say a silent prayer. Rest easy as the music plays and gather your strength to say goodbye. Love me tender, love me sweet, never let me go. You have made my life complete, and I love you so. Love me tender, love me true. All my dreams fulfill For my darling I love you And I always will Love me tender Love me long Take me For it's there that I belong And will never part Love me tender Love me true All my dreams fulfill For my darling And I always will Love me tender, love me dear Tell me you are mine I'll be yours through all the years Till the end of time Love me tender, love me true, all my dreams fulfill. For my darling, I love you, and I always. It's never easy to say goodbye to those that we love, but sadly it's time to let John go. Gather together your memories, place them in your hearts to be taken out when you're ready. If you can, please stand. Dearest John, today we pay tribute to you for all that you were. We thank you for the legacy that you leave in our memories and in the wonderful art that you created in many forms. We let you go from us in love and friendship. We honour the way you lived your life, the courage you displayed when you became ill, your character and your humour. But most of all, we honour the love that you gave to Carol and Chris. As we say farewell to you, you'll be loved and cherished forever. And as we commit our memories to be stored in our hearts, we send your soul to eternal rest. Go gently with our love, and may you rest in blissful peace. Please remain standing as I say a prayer for John. Father God, as we say farewell to John, 
We entrust him into your care. We pray for happiness and joy to be ahead of him, for wisdom and guidance to be beside him, and for grace and truth to be behind him, pushing him onwards into your goodness. We know that you'll always love and protect him wherever he goes. Amen. Please be seated. On behalf of Carol and Chris, I thank you for your presence here today. People have been really good and it's been so appreciated. There have been so many messages from around the world and they felt surrounded by love and support. In the true spirit of sharing, they'd like to invite you to join them to take refreshments and share memories and tributes to John at the Alma Lodge. They're going to make donations in John's name to the British Heart Foundation and the Fisherman's Mission, which John was a big supporter of, hence our final music. If you'd like to donate, please do so by placing your donation in the collection box, provided by George Ball Funeral Services on the way out. And Dan is going to hand some roses out for you to place on John's coffin. May strength, comfort and peace go with you all. 